our patients. Um, and there was, again, no difference in disease-free survival for AI sequence with tamoxifen. So in conclusion, we really are left with dealer's choice. If you're sitting across from a patient with a new diagnosis, you can use an upfront AI, or you can sequence it before or after tamoxifen. It's up to you. And it really depends on side effect profiles and other things. Another question. Is there an optimal aromatase inhibitor use? We have three to choose from. We've got two non-steroidal reversible AIs, which are anastrozole and letrozole, and we have exomestane, which is a re irreversible steroidal AI. We don't know the answer to that question yet, but we have two clinical trials that may tell us. The MA27 trial, also led by my colleague Paul Goss, and I mentioned it in passing, um, this is the trial that enrolled 7,576 women newly diagnosed with breast cancer and randomized them to exomestane versus anastrozole. It may sound like, well, why did you do that? Well, the important thing is that there's preclinical data that exomestane, which again is this steroidal irreversible AI, um, has dual actions. It's an aromatase inhibitor plus it's an androgen receptor agonist. And in preclinical models and in rat models, it actually appears that exomestane may have less detrimental effects on bone density. So there might be improved end organ function. So if this trial can demonstrate that these two um, treatments are equivalent in efficacy or if one is better than the other, that would be one thing. But another thing would be if one of these drugs had a better side effect profile. So for instance, if exomestane turns out to have less bone density problems, maybe that would be the superior drug to use. We don't have the results of this trial. It completed an enrollment about a year and a half ago, so hopefully we'll get those results within the next year or two. Similarly, the FACE trial um, took patients newly diagnosed with breast cancer, although it only included node-positive patients, and randomized 4,000 women internationally to receive letrozole for five years versus anastrozole for five years. These are the two non-steroidal AIs. Um, the rationale for the trial, I believe, is that there's preclinical data that suggests that letrozole inhibits the aromatase enzyme more completely than anastrozole. That's never been shown to be clinically significant, but this trial may um, inform us if, if that's the case or not, if that's an important distinction. Um, and then I think this is a fascinating trial called Soleil. Um, this is a trial that is testing whether intermittent aromatase inhibitor therapy might be beneficial for our patients. Um, so what this trial is doing is taking postmenopausal women after four to six years of adjuvant endocrine therapy and then randomizing them to continuous letrozole for five years, so daily letrozole, versus letrozole with three-month gaps for five years. So three months on, three months off, three months on, and you get the picture. So I think that you know our prostate cancer colleagues use intermittent therapy and they find that it's very helpful. And prostate cancer is another hormonally mediated cancer. It could be that in breast cancer, this might be something that's merited. And I think the other thing that might be interesting with intermittency is that if it's equivalent or better, um, the side effect profile will probably be better because they're off drug for longer throughout the year. Um, so essentially for patients with arthrol if you've had patients with arthrologists, for instance, on AIs, when you stop the AI, their side effects tend to go away within two weeks. It's nice to be off tr drug for as long as you can possibly be. So I think this is a very interesting trial that um, I look forward to seeing the results of. Now, are there factors that would predict more of a benefit for upfront AIs? So, for, you know, we, I've told you there really isn't any data from the big 198 trial or the team trial that upfront AI is better than sequencing TAM versus AI. But are there ways we can individualize treatment for our patients and figure out, you know, what characteristics of that patient's tumor or the patient themselves might predict which strategy is better? Okay. So these tumor factors might consist of what's their progesterone receptor status? Do PR negative patients benefit more from upfront AI rather than the sequence? What about the HER2 status? Is that an important predictor? What about tumor signatures, like such as the oncotype gene signature? You know, are patients at high risk for recurrence or get a high oncotype score, would they benefit more from upfront AI versus um, a sequence? And we also have an MGH2 gene signature, which is similar to oncotype. You know, would, would that show a difference? And then finally, there are host factors 
um, such as pharmacogenomics. I know there's a lot of excitement and talk about CYP2D6, which I'll go into in a little bit. You know, could CYP2D6 um, metabolizing status inform us as to which choice would be better? Um, I'll tell you with the tumor signatures, we don't know. These studies are underway, so that's controversial. So at this point, we can't really say anything about that. But let's talk about progesterone receptor status, because that's been flushed out quite a bit. Looking back on it, the ATAC investigators published a sub-study, or at least they showed it at, I believe, was San Antonio, that the patients who participated in the ATAC trial, 15% of the patients were ER-positive, PR-negative tumors. And it appeared that those patients actually benefited even greater from receiving upfront anastazole versus tamoxifen with a hazard ratio of 0.43, whereas their ER-positive, PR-positive population also had a benefit, but it was not as great, 0.84, and actually um, was not statistically significant. So when this data came out at first, there was some excitement to think, well, maybe the ER-positive, PR-negative patients should receive upfront AI rather than TAM sequence with an AI. But in fact, the other AI investigators decided to look at this subset analysis in their own populations. And in MA17, which was the late switch protocol, in fact, they didn't see that at all. The ER ER-positive, PR-negative patients, in fact, if you wanted to be... um, look at it, it actually, the patients who got letrozole didn't do as well numerically, although there wasn't enough patients to say anything about it. But the hazard ratio was 1.21, whereas ERPR positive patients, the hazard ratio was 0.49. So that was not proven in MA17. In IES, the ER positive PR negative patients benefited just as well as the ERPR positive patients did. So that was not shown in IES as well. And similarly, in BIG-198, the ER-positive PR-negative patients did just as well with similar hazard ratios than they did with the PR-positive population. So I think that 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 result has not been reproduced in other adjuvant AI trials. So I would not say that patients with ER-positive PR-negative disease should have an upfront AI because that hasn't really been um, fleshed out just now. So let's talk about CYP2D6 because this is an important point. What is that? Well, here's tamoxifen. I won't go through all of it because it's kind of busy. But here are the meta- major metabolites of tamoxifen, and desmethyl tamoxifen and 4-hydroxy tamoxifen, and then endoxifen, which is considered the most potent metabolite of tamoxifen. And all of these um, tamoxifen and its metabolites exert its effect on estrogen receptor, promotes ER-alpha degradation, and um, works that way. And as you can see, the major enzyme that metabolizes tamoxifen is CYP2D6, as seen here. What is CYP2D6? Well, cytochrome P450, 2D6, is expressed predominantly in the liver, and it's actually responsible for the mechanism or the metabolism of nearly a quarter of the drugs we prescribe, including beta blockers, antiarrhythmics, antidepressants, which obviously is something that we give a lot to our patients, antipsychotics, and tamoxifen. Its activity is really very highly variable um, with their genetic variants, because there are many genetic variants. There have been over 100 different CYP2D6 alleles that have been described. Um, The wild type allele is called CYP2D6 star 1. And importantly, um, you know, I'm actually of um, one of my major interests is disparities. These frequencies of these CYP2D6 alleles vary greatly among ethnic groups, okay? So in Caucasians, there's a null allele seen in a quarter of patients. Asians, greater than half of the patients actually have an intermediate metabolizing um, uh, genotype with CYP2D6. And in African Americans, nearly a quarter of the patients actually have reduced activity of this enzyme, so that could be potentially important. So why do we care? And it's because Matt gets um, presented this now um, a couple of years ago. It was updated last year at San Antonio um, in 2008 um, and looked back in a clinical trial population where patients got adjuvant tamoxifen. And they looked, he looked at relapse-free time according to CYP2D6 metabolizer status. And what the study showed was that patients who were poor metabolizers of CYP2D6 seemed to have um, significantly inferior relapse-free survival compared to patients who are extensive metabolizers, arguing that they weren't making the endoxifen, which is the most important metab- or most potent metabolite, and maybe tamoxifen is not the best drug for these patients. 
but I would bring your attention to show you how very few patients were in this study. There were only 16 who were poor metabolizers, 108 who were extensive metabolizers, 65 were intermediate metabolizers. Um, nevertheless, in this small study, the hazard ratio was 4.0 of poor metabolizers relative to extensive metabolizers. So this created great excitement. Um, at this past San Antonio, um, Nat tried to present um, a more worldwide cohort where they tried to get many more specimens, um, and they failed to see a difference. But there was a lot of problems with that study and uh, abilities to get um, samples, essentially. So I really think that while this is provocative, this is not enough to change clinical practice at this time because there are just few two numbers. Um, but we should be cognizant of the genotype frequencies in the population, realizing that, you know, about 72% are wild type, so it'll be extensive metabolizers. About 20% will be intermediate, and about 7% um, may be slow metabolizers. Um, even though, you know, I don't think that it's ready for prime time to do CYP2D6 genotyping in everybody who's about to get an adjuvant endocrine therapy, we do have to realize that we give a lot of drugs that also inhibit CYP2D6. Um, and these drugs may interact with tamoxifen, although um, studies have not been definitive about this. Um, strong inhibitors of CYP2D6 um, include bupropion, fluoxetine, peroxidine, and quinidine. Moderate inhibitors are duloxetine, terbenafine. Weak inhibitors include amiodarone, cimetidine, and sertraline. So even though we don't have enough data to tell us that we really should be avoiding these drugs in patients who take tamoxifen, I think it makes sense to be cautious when you're thinking about drug choices. So we often prescribe SSRIs, for instance, for hot flashes, and um, then the faxine t appears to be the least, it really doesn't seem to have a, a, much of an effect on CYP2D6 at all, so that would be the drug of choice. And we would probably recommend avoiding fluoxetine and peroxetine if you possibly can because of this potential interaction. Um, this is actually, I think, an important slide. You know, AIs may be superior, but what's its cost? Um, according to drugstore.com, a month's supply of an AI, as seen as the top three rows, will run you about $300 to $400. Um, and this is particularly relevant, I think, in our Medicare population um, who have just Part D because they fall into the donut hole pretty quickly in the year, um, and then they're responsible for 100% of its cost. Um, and as you can see here, generic tamoxifen will run them $22 a month. So I think that this is something that we ought to keep in mind. And usually when I'm talking to patients and talking about AI versus tamoxifen, I really want to make sure that cost is not going to be a barrier um, because you don't want to send them out writing prescription for anastasol or whatever and then have, get a call the next day saying, I didn't realize it was going to be so expensive. It really should be discussed up front. Um, I'm just going to say a few words about premenopausal patients. If I have, yeah, I think I have the time. The standard of care is five years of tamoxifen. AIs don't work in premenopausal patients, but there are two worldwide trials, the soft and text trials, which are looking at whether ovarian function suppression would be helpful in this population. Um, the soft trial is randomizing people to standard tamoxifen versus ovarian function suppression plus TAM versus ovarian function suppression plus exemestane. The text trial, ovarian function suppression for all, and looking at AIs in that setting. So I think that I could, we should basically, based on available evidence, the recommendations in 2010 are that AIs should be used as either initial or therapy or after treatment with tamoxifen. The role of genomics or biomarkers in selecting optimal endocrine therapy is controversial. And the optimal time to switch from an AI to tamoxifen is really not known. You could do it two to three years. You could do it or five years. It's supported by clinical trials. Um, as far as specific populations, a specific marker or clinical subset that predicts which strategy is optimal has not yet been identified. An important point, I don't want to forget the men, tamoxifen remains standard of care for male breast cancer. There is very little data to support any use of AI in, in men. cyp 6 genotype is not generally recommended to select adjuvant endocrine therapy, but it seems to make sense to use caution when you're doing concurrent use of cyp 2 6 inhibitors with tamoxifen because of possible drug interactions. Um, you should consider side effect profiles and patient preferences and pre-existing conditions when discussing your options, and side effect profiles should be discussed in detail. In premenopausal women, tamoxifen remains the standard of care, but we're looking at ovarian function suppression and clinical trials 